If something in your car breaks or stops working, like your radiator, you can always just take it out and replace it. But what about us? If my body parts break down, like my heart, I might be able to get a transplant. But right now, even if I could find a replacement part, one, it's going to be used. And two, my body might just reject it. The dream would be to replace my heart or whatever's broken with a brand new version in perfect working condition, but exactly like my original. People have been talking about this for years, but now, thanks to some brand new discoveries, the dream of custom-made, personalized body parts may soon become a reality. In the 2005 sci-fi thriller, The Island, people have found a way to live forever. They grow clones and harvest their organs. But real science may be on the verge of a less diabolical solution. This, for example, is no special effect. It's a lab-grown lung, no clone attached. I absolutely see a day where you'll walk into a manufacturing facility somewhere and there will be jars of kidneys and jars of livers and jars of lungs, whatever it is you need. Just as in the island, your body would accept the new organ because it would be yours, grown from your cells. And there would be no more waiting lists for organs. There would be no more rejection. We would enter a new era where we could build the you an identical, ideal replacement. But how do you make an organ without a body to build it in? We've been growing cells in the lab for decades, but they just sit around in flat layers or clumps. So how would you coax them to form a three-dimensional organ like a heart with chambers, valves, and blood vessels? Maybe it's the same way you go from this to this. See, an organ is not unlike a building. It's a collection of parts that has to come together and work together. Think of a cinder block as a cell. The problem is, a block or a cell alone is not enough. To construct a building, you need to begin with an internal framework or scaffold to define the parts and hold them together. 30 years ago, transplant surgeon Jay Vacanti and chemical engineer Robert Langer realized that to build an organ, cells also need a framework, a scaffold to guide their growth. The challenge was to engineer scaffold materials living tissue could grow on. So this is a material that we call bio-rubber. Bio-rubber, and you, you use the prefix bio because whatever is the material it will take to flesh or living cells. That's right. So why does the cell even care? Because a lot of things could be toxic to a cell. Uh, or, or the cell wouldn't like their surface and wouldn't be able to grow on it. Picky cells. Cells are picky, and some are more picky than others. <laughs> but sculpting a scaffold out of the right material was only a start. To turn one into a living body part, an ear, for example, it must then be seeded with cells. A few weeks in an incubator allows those cells to multiply, covering the scaffold. Then comes a rather strange test. This is really creepy. I mean, mice are creepy enough, and this one has no hair, and a human ear growing on its back. Yes. He doesn't seem to mind that he has an ear growing on his back. No, he knows he's here for a bigger purpose. But this is a very, very important step in the science, because on the back of this animal, we're actually incubating and growing perfect cartilage in the shape of a human ear. And it's completely connected to the blood vessels, so that it's just like a native ear in a normal circumstance. In the head of a person. That's correct. So when this finally gets implanted in a human, you don't expect rejection, as is so common with new body parts. Exactly, because we're going to start with the patient's own cells It'll make his own tissue, and therefore the body will accept it. Within a year, Vacanti and Langer expect to be implanting their ears directly on the heads of soldiers wounded in Iraq and Afghanistan. 
But these will not be the first recipients of lab-grown body parts. Already, patients of other doctors have received blood vessels, skin, muscles, even bladders built the same way. I think with enough research, most parts of the body will be replaceable. And I haven't come across very many body parts where somebody somewhere isn't working on trying to replace them. Which is certainly encouraging news for people who need more complex body parts, like 20-year-old Stacy. I was in the hospital and that's when they came in and told me that I may need a new liver. But will she get one? Every day, nearly 20 Americans die waiting for donor organs. So this problem is an extraordinary problem. There are too few organs for the well over 100,000 Americans waiting. But if we are ever to make the complex organs most needed to save lives, like livers and hearts, the scaffold builders will have to overcome an obstacle, namely plumbing. In a building, it's pretty straightforward. Pipes carry fluid where it's needed, just like blood vessels in the body, except that in a major organ, like the heart. You need a blood vessel per cell because the heart works all day, every day. Then I don't know if you've ever seen blood vessels really but they look like a tree and the challenge is not to build that big limb but to build those little tiny branches that come off but building these intricate branches might be unnecessary if we take advantage of a remarkable fact organs are not just made of cells so if you wash the cells away what's left well, what's left are these proteins on which the cells sit and they form the framework of the organ, the scaffold. These natural scaffolds hold an organ's shape down to the smallest detail, including every blood vessel. So could they be used to build a complex organ like a heart? Six years ago, no one could say, because no one had ever stripped a heart of its cells, leaving the scaffold intact. But Taylor's colleague, Harold Ott, thought he could find a way. He would use the blood vessels in a rat's heart to deliver a chemical that would dissolve its cells and nothing else. But which chemical? So the process of finding the right chemical was literally a try and error process, starting from A to Z on the chemical shelf. First, Ott tried enzymes, but they dissolved both the cells and the scaffold. Other chemicals caused the hearts to swell up. Finally, he tried a soap commonly found in shampoos. We saw the heart become translucent. And it was obvious to us all that something had happened that hadn't happened the months before. What we had is this thing that looked like a heart. But it looked like a ghost heart, if you will. Injections of dye showed the scaffold to be undamaged down to the smallest blood vessels. And we now know that this technique works with many organs, including human-sized ones. This is essentially the scaffold of a heart. Who knew a heart had a full skeleton? But it essentially has no cells, dead or alive. It's beautiful. You can see the blood vessels here, the chambers of the heart. You can see the valves. But could a bare scaffold once again become the framework of a living heart? Taylor soon discovered it was more than a matter of injecting cells. Just putting cells on a scaffold isn't enough. It's putting cells on a scaffold and giving them an electrical signal and giving them a mechanical blood pressure and then giving them oxygen. It's not just a heart in a jar, it's a heart in an artificial body. So it's simple in many ways, and it's unbelievably complicated. After eight days, the first lab-grown heart beat on its own. It really makes you go, what is life? The first time you see something beat that was dead, it's one of those yes moments in life. 
Since then, Ott has joined Massachusetts General Hospital and used the same method to build a pair of lungs. After coming back to life, one lung was successfully implanted in a rat. So if you can make a working, living lung, then it seems to me you can... Make build literally any organ. Any, any organ. This novel approach has already made a difference in the real world. In Barcelona, Spain, this woman, Claudia Castillo, might be dead without it. Two years ago, tuberculosis devastated her windpipe, <coughs> making it difficult for her to breathe. But surgeon Paolo Macchiarini saw a solution. Give Claudia a new windpipe, which her body would never reject, because it would be made of her own cells, grown on a natural scaffold. And so, in June of 2008, Macchiarini and an international team of specialists removed a windpipe from a human cadaver, washed it clean, and reseeded it with living cells from Claudia's body. Four days later, the new windpipe was transplanted into Claudia. If you transplant an organ without tissue engineering, you need immunosuppression, you need close watching, and this was absolutely not the case for Claudia. She never had any sign of rejection. Indeed, four days after surgery, she was home. More than a year later, Claudia is living a normal life, free of the fear that she will reject her new body part. I feel like the transplant is not from the body of another person. It's mine. That sense of ownership might soon be crucial to organ recipients, because their scaffolds might not come from a person at all. This is a pig kidney sliced in half, and it's the same size, same complexity as a human kidney. We could cover this with human cells and, in theory, build you a kidney. Human organs built on natural or artificial scaffolds? Made from a patient's own cells to avoid rejection? Available in unlimited supply? Most researchers believe it will be a reality within decades. And Taylor is even more optimistic. Kidney, liver, lung. We're not decades away from building something complicated. We're more like years away.